is our pleasure to celebrate this achievement by Dr. Angelique Nixon, and we encourage you to get your own copy of this text because we want to re-examine our perspectives about tourism within the region. And to formally welcome you, I invite our head of department at Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Dr. Paula Morgan. It's good that you're here. I know that you had a lot of other things to do and you chose to come here to be with us. And we are grateful, we don't take it for granted. It is my privilege to welcome you this evening on behalf of the Institute of Gender and Development Studies. I, I was reminded a week ago as to why the Institute is such a fine place to be associated with when a member of our Board of Studies expressed her unvarnished appreciation of the dedication and passion of our team of competent young scholars who have taken up the responsibility to run with the various and diverse facets of our program. We are here today to honor the scholarly output of one of our newest members of staff, Dr. Angelique Nixon, who came to us first as a Fulbright scholar. We were so impressed that by dint of much effort, I remember that day when we had much effort at persuading the board that we should keep her and we did the right thing because already she's done us proud. Her work, Resisting Culture, Tourism, Resisting Culture, Tourism, Diaspora, and Sexuality in Caribbean Culture, zeroes in on the fact that for centuries the Caribbean has occupied an overdetermined location in the global imaginary. The relentless signification of paradise has been a major endeavor of Western philosophers, thinkers, authors, visionaries, and charlatans intent on capturing and consuming the other. Indeed, contemporary discourse and media programming, such as HGTV, House Hunters International, continue to train us in how to see, stage, and consume our own landscapes and our residences. I like HGTV, that's how come I know. And our scholars, like Angelique Nixon, are Bahamian-born and culturally aware uh, Inca has placed her trained eye on the phenomena she must have been imbibing since infancy. This work then is an act of retraining the eye and reshaping desire and recalibrating value. She interrogates the nature of the traveler's interface with post environments and cultures. She issues a claim for more respective modalities. In her own words, resisting paradise posits an imperative relationship between the rewriting of history and challenging tourism and exploitative consumption. It is good that she should have done this work. Gerald Manley Hopkins reminds us that despite the gross and shameless exploitative practices, that there is an inherent regenerative impulse that stabilizes and restores. Hence he states, for all this, the world is not spent. However, in this season, we seem to be engulfing faster, consuming as if there is no tomorrow, commoditizing humans as if bodies does not bodies do not house a transcendent and eternal spirit. It's good that Dr. Nixon should have done this work because should our region be spent, the skilled consumers will simply seek the next unspoiled paradise. If need be, spend millions and travel to the moon, so to do. But we here on our islands will weep and mourn for our loss and replace joy in place and belonging with nostalgia. That will not do, and therefore we are grateful for the work that has been done. I do welcome you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Strong words indeed. Uh, we should not take our paradise for granted, nor should we have our paradise recreated and reinterpreted for us. So we take the warning. And now we get to the meat of the matter, of course, and this is to review and launch this necessary necessary text by Dr. Nixon, and this is to be done by Dr. Lyndon Gill. Dr. Gill is an assistant professor of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Gill received his PhD in African American Studies and Anthropology from Harvard University and he has received postdoctoral fellowships from Princeton University, the University of Pennsylvania, and the Ford Foundation. He's currently completing his first book, Erotic Islands, Art and Activism in the Queer Caribbean. And he is also a performance artist, 
a performance poet and installation artist. Thank you for a beautiful introduction. I don't have much to say after uh, Professor Morgan. I think you did all whatever she said, but note that and go and get the book. What do I have to say after that? I mean, that was so stunningly put. But it's really an honor to be here. Uh, evening to you all. My most sincere gratitude to you, Dr. Nixon, um, for this invitation to join in this celebration of what's really an impressively meticulous and regular, rigorously artful new book. Um, so, and I thank you, as, the, as Professor Morgan said, for this very necessary work. So thank you, Angelique, for doing that work for us. Um, Congratulations again to you um, as a relatively new, your new position here at the uh, University of West Indies, St. Augustine. Um, many here in Trinidad and Tobago, across the region and throughout the diaspora are overjoyed, may I say, um, that you are joining an already formidable intellectual community at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. Um, so you all are going for a quality over quantity, I see, and you're doing a very good job at it. Uh, so it's, it's really beautiful to have you here together. Have you here at St. Augustine is really a, a joy and to be so close to you all. Um, Dr. Nixon and I both share the distinction of having been Fulbright scholars here at IGDS. So this is a family reunion of sorts, um, and I could not be more pleased to be back for such an auspicious fet. <laughs> so I hope we continue this with drinks afterwards. Um, the first order of business is simple, and it's the insistence that if you haven't yet read Resisting Paradise, you must not leave here tonight without a plan to get a copy in your hand. Get a copy in your hand tonight. Right. Good. Get through. Right. <laughs> so the copy is here for sale. Make sure you stand up, line up to get yours first. Um, but what I want to briefly offer here is a bit of incentive for your search to get your copy uh, if you don't already have it. And at the same time, I want to propose two useful, but though by no means exhaustive, framing structures for the rest of us who've already read the text or will soon have the pleasure. These hermeneutics I lovingly borrow from standout concepts in Dr. Nixon's text uh, that I expand only slightly to reach towards some big questions for us to consider when approaching the book. So the two concepts I want us to uh, think about uh, when in preparation for hearing Dr. Nixon's um, presentation of the text. The first is migratory artifacts. That's migratory artifacts. So Dr. Nixon uses this phrase to describe literature um, that, inform, that is informed by migratory and diasporic experience. I want to use this concept, migratory artifacts, um, to focus our attention not only on the principal importance of movement in the text, and movement here of course of bodies, but also of imaginations, resources, art, um, uh, but also on the kind of, uh, to focus us on the kind of accountable and responsible movement the text asks of us here at home. Right? So we're quick to think about uh, sort of foreigners, uh, foreigners uh, coming to Trinidad, but I want us to think about another kind of travel, another kind of tourism that's a little closer to home. I'll get to that. Uh, the second issue, the concept that I want us to think, think through is vexed boundaries. And I want to remix Dr. Nixon's phrase, vexed relations, as a fruitful way uh, into, the conversa into a conversation that focuses uh, on her analysis of the complexities within the behemoth, Bahamian tourism industry, as a way to get at some of the larger methodological implications of her book. So what is her book teaching us about method in one of her beautifully written chapters about the Bahamas tourism industry? I'll return to these concepts, migratory artifacts and vexed boundaries, as signposts throughout this brief engagement, but I introduce them here um, to you uh, as a way to give us a sense of where we're heading. So first, migratory artifacts. Let's start with paradise. The word itself is derived from the ancient Eastern Iranian or Western compound paradaisa that literally referred to a walled enclosure from Pyre which means around, and dis, meaning to create or to make, so literally to enclose. The word paradise means to enclose. The term eventually was used to describe primarily royal parks and menageries, which are often walled. It first appears in Greek as a description of, the, of a park for animals, and is most notably used in the 3rd to 1st century BCE Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible to approximate the Hebrew word for garden. 
the Judeo-Christian Garden of Eden, which is the primary symbolic reference for the conceptualization of paradise in the Euro-American West, is described as a paradise as a result of this etymological ancestry, from enclosed menagerie to approximating he the word in Hebrew for garden to uh, where we are now. An idyllic enclosure for foreign and unfamiliar and thus exotic flora and fauna, paradise quite literally contains various elsewheres. A static artifact of mobility, paradise as menagerie is possible because of movement and, and provides a marvel because it offers access to objects and sometimes subjects out of place. It is no coincidence that this garden of migratory artifacts comes to signify the Caribbean primarily in the post-Lapsarian Judeo-Christian West or after the fall. Um, but it is a bit of an odd redoubling indeed that this forced menagerie of a region should be made by multinational pirates to play host to gaggles of walled-in tourists, sun-starved bodies out of place, holiday makers eager still for a 15th century wet dream. So paradise has always had a strained relationship to mobility. Who and what moves, who and what doesn't, and the seductive oddity of objects or subjects out of place, right up against the reassurance of objects and subjects in their proper place. It should come as little surprise then that in a study about tourism and the paradise fantasies that the industry trades in, that movement and immobility prove an insistent dual trope. This Dr. Nixon quite aptly rec recognizes when she says, and I quote, tourism can both mobilize and immobilize, end quote. And it's not only about bodies that move or organize or don't, but also dreams, goods, fantasies, opinions, poetry, money, art, ideas, feelings. A light-skinned, black-identified, mixed-race, queer-identified, bisexual, Bahamian woman raised in the working class who travels across the Caribbean region and beyond, Dr. Nixon, in being forthright about who she is and how she moves, asks of us a similarly daring temp transparency about who we are and the identitarian baggage we carry. As an Afro-Trinidadian American, I've, I've come to appreciate Yankee Dadian as a descriptor of myself. <laughs> so as a Yankee Dadian, queer, ident identified gay man raised in urban work working class New York, New York City, but living temporarily now in Tobago, I, much like black Caribbean American lesbian warrior poet Audre Lorde, am not immune, Dr. Nixon's text reminds me, uh, to an unethical relationship to the spiritual and cultural home I claim here in Trinidad. She keeps me on my P's and Q's, right? Um, and my being here requires a constant vigilance about my privilege, a diligent commitment to cultivating accountability, and a deep sense of personal and communal responsibility to approach becoming the kind of revolutionary traveler that Dr. Nixon christens Audre Lorde. Revolutionary here, of course, uh, in a sense of radical political, uh, of, of radical politics in contrast to a kind of neo-colonial tourist, but also in terms of a circular movement or responsible return migration. So revolution also as that kind of coming full circle, that rounding, right? Um, and so it's that responsible return migration that, I, that we see in the life of the Harlem-born Audre Lorde who decides to spend her last days in St. Croix, right? but doesn't do so in a haphazard way, does so in a very responsible way. We want to be that kind of responsible uh, traveler. But perhaps one entry point through which the largest proportion of the Trinidadian public might begin to approach Dr. Nixon's deep investment in the ethical or responsible travel or tourism might be across the sea bridge to Tobago. Dr. Nixon encourage, uh, encourages us across this bridge in her engagement with Unia Kempadu's novel, Tide Running, about a tragic sex tourism triangle in Tobago between a young black man from Plymouth and a wealthy couple that eerily resembles the recently murdered British Trini couple Richard and Grace Wheeler. I won't rehearse Dr. Nixon's thorough reading of the novel, which she does with the help, the impeccable help of uh, one of UWI St. Augustine's own, Dr. Jennifer Rahim, um, but it used it here as a way to bring light to Trinidadians, and if I may, may be so brazen, um, UWI St. Augustine's relationship to the too often stepsister Isle. In our consideration of tourism and travel, what might it mean to take a look in our own front yard 
first to un in our own front yard first to unmask the Ash Wednesday fantasies, the exercise the Tobago jazz jumbies, get to the true crab and dumpling reality of language, life, faith, and culture, a short flight up the road. How do we hear Dr. Nixon's indictment differently from a Trinidadian vantage if we hear her critique of the world of tourists who land on these shores as different, though not altogether distinct, from Trinidadian tourism in Tobago? Much like Bahamians of a certain class, certain Trinis, too, are playing tourists in Tobago like old mass. As part of a perpetuation of what Dr. Nixon insists is a fantasy of Tobago as Trinidad's most intimate, exotic other. If we listen for the poetic meta-significance of Dr. Nixon's proposition that Tobago is literally the black space of the nation, and yes, blackness here in terms of race, but also in the connotative sense of the unknown, the dark, the galactic, the foreboding, that which is saturated with colors. So what it means to think about Tobago as that kind of black space. Black space in terms of race, but also black space in terms of other kinds of possibilities of blackness. I think it's a really um, fruitful proposition. Um, um, what is the influence of Tobago tourism on the cultural and sexual identity of the Trimbagonian nation? i let that sit. And takes us to our second concept, vexed boundaries. So true to its Latin etymological roots, vexation shakes the trees of our comfortable existence to see what fruits fall. Vexation disturbs the lull in our spirit gardens and coaxes us towards something new. Dr. Nixon uses the phrase vexed relations to describe the complex interplay of culture, race, and sex in the, in the literary labor of Caribbean writers Michelle Cliff, Christian Campbell, and Unia Kempadu. The phrase describes a kind of familiar disturbance, um, an intimate shaking up of that, um, shaking up um, that's as useful for considering the overlapping of these identities, I think, as it is for describing Dr. Nixon's transdisciplinary methodology. So I want to focus a little bit on methodology, although to think about identity is really important and useful. Um, so in her chapter, Living and Imagining in Paradise, the Culture of uh, a Tourist Economy, about the Bahamian tourist economy, um, Dr. Nixon models for us a rigorously migratory methodology. And I would argue that this is a treasured heirloom of the post-colonial transnational feminist of color legacy that she so adamantly and lovingly embraces. Um, so absolute disciplinary distinction with its correlative presumption of methodological ownership is one of the self-perpetuating fantasies of the academy. In fact, traditional disciplines, methods, and as anyone familiar with their often shared origin narratives and often shared founding thinkers knows, are perhaps better thought of as discrete strangers, as better thought of not as discrete strangers, but as cousins, or in some cases, siblings, these are the disciplines, who for some reason don't speak to each other as often as they once did or should. Vexed relations, indeed. But as many of us know all too well, just because you fall out with family does not mean family done. And in, and in many of our families, surely, there are those bridge-building grannies, tanties, cousins, uncles, who does good on good with everyone. Tante Angelique is doing just that bridging work for us across disciplinary cliques, defying parochial methodological ownership claims. In this model chapter, the one about the Bohemian tourist industry, Dr. Nixon combines fieldwork and ethnographic, ethnographic interviews with 19 workers in the Bohemian, in Bohemian culture and tourism industries alongside analysis of Marion Bethel's poetry, Dion Benjamin Smith's visual art, and the Junkanoo activism of Arlene Nash Ferguson. What might it mean to consider Dr. Nixon's masterfully managed transdisciplinary multi-method approach, an approach capacious enough to hold together quotidian life, artistry, and activism? What might it mean to think about that approach as as an important methodological legacy of transnational women of color feminist analysis. These feminist theorists and artists have given us all, as Dr. Nixon reminds us, permission to admit that all theorizing, I'll say that again, all theorizing, even in the bastions of continental European philosophy, all knowledge and cultural production is connected to personal experience in the context of community and history, in spite of a whole range of denials. 
it's still connected. But what if these founding feminist intellectual activists of color have also modeled for us a method that is perhaps an overlooked birthmark of their legacy in the emergent transdisciplinary field of queer Caribbean studies and black queer diaspora studies? Like many of the shared progenitors of, a traditional cis, of the traditional cis disciplines, many of the transnational queer of color feminist ancestors and thought leaders across these multidisciplinary fields are the same. Audre Lorde, Jackie Alexander, Jafari Allen come to mind immediately. So, what if an attention to mixed methods and an undisciplined disciplinarity guided by the tools necessary for the work as opposed to predetermined by any particular field can help us to recognize more clearly how transnational postcolonial feminist women of color as knowledge and culture producers help clear a space for living in, thinking about, and creating from the queer Caribbean and by extension within Africa's queer diaspora. It is by vexing the various boundaries between disciplines and method and demonstrating that this is part of a longer legacy that Dr. Nixon helps us to appreciate more thoroughly the migratory artifacts that work on us, through us, and that ultimately constitute us. Thanks. your rethinking paradise, uh, both in terms of how you interpret and experience it. And I find that conversation of Trinidad and Tobago and the juxtaposition of how we, we use the space is very interesting and really and truly allows us to, as they say, look at self first. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gill, for that very thorough and indeed eye-opening evaluation of the text. You all know that Dr. Nixon is Bahamian, and she's very clear about her identification. But it is also good that she, she's well-placed to evaluate tourism as she's a woman of the region, now an adopted Trini, and wherever else she plans to go. But we're gonna keep her. <laughs> uh, Dr. Nixon is a writer, an artist, a teacher, a scholar, an activist, and a poet. Like most people who work in gender, they just want to do everything. <laughs> she recently joined our faculty at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, as Dr. Morgan mentioned, and she was indeed a Fulbright scholar before this. Her research, cultural criticism, and poetry have been published widely in academic and literary journals. Her work has also been featured on ARC Magazine, The Feminist Wire, Groundation Grenada, and Zora Magazine. She is an author of the poetry and art collection, Saltwater Heat Healing, a myth, memoir, and poems. So that's not for sale today, but you know you could get that as well. Take that prop. <laughs> uh, Dr. Nixon is also the co-chair of the Caribbean IRN, which connects activists, researchers, teachers, and artists who do work on diverse genders and sexualities. She works with a number of community-based organizations, including the Grassroots Healing Collective, IET Resurrect, that focuses on women's empowerment, sustainability, education, and health in Haiti. I didn't say the name of the place because I don't know how to pronounce it. Isn't that sad? Lagoon, Lagain, Leogain, Leogon. Wow, I did Spanish in school. But it's in Haiti, <laughs> which is excellent. And we're very pleased that she continues this work. And I'm sure if you want to speak to her afterwards about that, you can find out more. She's working with LGBTI organizations and advocates and advocates. Uh, advocacy groups in Trinidad and Tobago, including CAISO, and Allies for Justice and Diversity. And she is co-creator of a new youth arts program called Community Yard. That program engages stick fighting and models of restorative justice as a way to build empowerment and self-reliance while also cultivating transformation and healing. So. Dr. Nixon does everything. And now I call upon her to do one very important thing, which is to respond to that excellent review and to acknowledge, uh, of course, this very much hard labor of love and present and make her presentation. <laughs> <laughs> 